Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicel technology. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gill, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Great news. You can now watch the entire documentary on Apple TV, iTunes, YouTube Movies, and Google Play. Also, please visit the film's website at OpenYourEyes2020.com. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. According to Ann Haynes, over 50% of the U.S. population is either diabetic or pre-diabetic, causing ocular side effects in over 20% of these patients. In fact, diabetic retinopathy is the most common cause of new cases of blindness in working age U.S. adults. Today's guests, South Florida optometric physician, Dr. Diane Shackman, and vitreal retinal surgeon, Dr. Danny Diaz. Dr. Shackman and Diaz are both diabetic ocular educators and have authored several publications. Dr. Shackman served as a full-time professor for 18 years at Nova Southeastern University, where she served as a coordinator of the Diabetes and Macula Clinic. Dr. Diaz completed his ophthalmology residency at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary, Harvard Medical School. Dr. Diaz then completed his fellowship in vitreoretinal retinal disease and surgery at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, University of Miami. Dr. Diaz's research includes macular degeneration and diabetes. Doctors, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shackman, let me start with you. Is diabetes an epidemic? Oh, there is no question that diabetes is an epidemic nowadays. Um, we are seeing more and more diabetic patients pretty much every single day. There is, I would say, about 34 million Americans living with diabetes. And one of the things that kind of worries me more, it's not only the diabetes, but the pre-diabetic patients. And how many pe people have pre-diabetes? I would say about three times as much. We're looking at potentially 88 million individuals living with pre-diabetes. And if you have pre-diabetes, what's the chances of you getting diabetes? I still think it's actually pretty high. A lot of these patients has what we call the insulin resistant, and most of them don't follow the right rules with regards to nutrition or exercising. So they put themselves at risk. The pre-diabetic is the one that we have a time to do something of it now. And most of them, unfortunately, don't follow the guidelines to be able to change those steps. It's like a warning shot. Uh, Dr. Diaz, about 100 million people that have uh, diabetes or pre-diabetes have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Can you explain why that's a risk factor for somebody becoming diabetic? You know, I think uh, the, the underlying pathophysiology is about the same, right? You have people who are who have uh, uh, high levels of insulin resistance, uh, which may do maybe due to you know multiple comorbidities, their lifestyles, uh, weight problems, for example. And over time, this just unfortunately cracks down at their you know their armor, and um, it just increases the risk of them developing actual full blown uh, diabetes diabetes uh, mellitus. So insulin resistance is is considered the cause of diabetes. Dr. Diaz, if you could explain to us what insulin resistance is. You know, it's just our ability of our of our body to kind of deal with the uh, uh, the influx of, of uh, sugar metabolism, right? And an ability for the own, its own body to kind of produce insulin, which then allows for the uptake of, of the sugar and the uh, carbohydrate molecules um, from mainly our diet. 
So if, if, if we're not able to sort of um, uh, deal with this um, uh, increase in bulk and carbohydrate metabolism, then, um, you know, uh, over time, then it's going to lead to, you know, fatty storage and, uh, um, you know, uh, further risk of, of, of metabolic syndrome and so forth, which, which can over time um, just lead to diabetes. Before people get their blood sugar goes up, their insulin goes up. And it's thought that insulin before you become your blood sugar goes up is just as dangerous. It elevated insulin is just as dangerous as elevated blood sugar. Can you explain what elevated insulin does to the body, Dr. Diaz? Well, elevated insulin over time basically is, is going to cause um, 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 it, it, without an ability to basically uh, control the blood sugar with uh, with insulin, then you're going to basically develop a glycosylated hemoglobin levels to go up, which then cause damage to the small uh, microvascular or um, you know, in the eyes, the kidneys, and so forth. Um, that then over time is just going to cause um, um, it's going to increase risk of of cardiovascular disease, stroke, um, and um, um, basically just, uh, you know, leave us in an overall worse or systemic state. Uh, Dr. Shackman, uh, Dr. Diaz mentioned cardiovascular disease, stroke. Can you explain why people are at greater risk of cardiovascular disease or stroke if they have diabetes? I like to make things in a simplistic manner. Uh, diabetes in itself is what I call head to toe disease, macro and microvascular entities. So what are we looking at is the effects of the major vessels, such as the ones you see in the heart stroke, increases the chances of stroke and um, heart attacks for about three to four times as much. When it comes to microvascular diseases, those are the ones of the eyes, kidneys, and even the neuropathy. So those are the ones that are actually more susceptible, which is why we as eye care practitioners see a lot of these patients, maybe even undiagnosed with the disease. And if you, you know, people get confused between type one and type two diabetes. Dr. Sheckman, if you could explain the difference and why type one is an autoimmune disease as well. So the type one is an autoimmune disease. The, the Potential, the fact is that these patients have an attack on their beta cells of the pancreas and they don't make any insulin whatsoever. So in doing so, that's why they become insulin dependent. They need insulin from very early on. These are the six-year-olds, the eight-year-olds are actually usually very thin, unlike our type two diabetic patients. And there is a genetic predisposition to these patients. Over time, they will develop retinopathies primarily because of the duration of the disease. But the interesting part is they don't develop diabetic retinopathy very early on because of hormonal effects that actually prevent them from having the disease early on. Your type 2 diabetics are 90% of the patients. Those are the patients who are insulin independent. They usually can be treated initially with diet and uh, drugs like we call the glucophage and metformin, decreasing the blood sugar levels to allow their insulin to be a bit more effective. Many of them are insulin resistant. They usually have a family history of diabetes, but by controlling the diet in itself, it has a huge impact because you are lowering the amount of glucose the insulin has to work on in order to be able to cause more effectiveness to this. You just want normal levels of sugar in our bloodstream. And that's what your insulin is trying to help out with. You know, every once in a while, you'll see a patient maybe in their 50s or 60s in fact, this happened to my neighbor. You know, he's a thin guy. He's not the typical type two diabetic with the big belly. And, uh, and all, he comes down with diabetes. And Nate said he has latter, latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. And he looks like a type one, but he's 50, 60 years old. Can you talk about that type of person, that type of patient for me, uh, Dr. Diaz? So I think that, um, it, you know, these LATA and then sort of the uh, MODY type of diabetes, you know, they, they can, they present with signs and symptoms of type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. So the diagnosis can actually be challenging in these patients. They may be initially in, uh, insulin dependent, which means they can, uh, independent, which means their body can still produce insulin, um, but um, they can... 
they can progress and slowly uh, lose their ability to produce insulin over time. And it can actually, I think, I think LATA is responsible for about two to 10% of all diabetes in the adult population. And, you know, it's, it's all about the spectrum and whether, uh, how long it takes for them to basically lose their ability to produce insulin over time. Um, I think I've also heard a term that they call it like type 1.5 diabetes, where it's not fully type one or type two. Um, and, but it, but it can, it can be just as destructive. So it's, it's, it's about following these patients over time and just kind of managing to see where they're at and at what point they might need more, more, more help in, 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 with insulin production. As far as the eye is concerned, uh, Dr. Schechtman, uh, if they're ladder type one or type two, but they're trying really hard with their control, who seems to do the worst out of the, 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 the three, those three categories and who seems to do the best or can we not really tell it really, it depends on the patient. I, I think it's all um, independent to some degree because there's so many other factors. As we know, it, there's so many facets uh, affecting us. We know the A1C is a major effect. We know duration is effect. Nutrition is an effect. Comorbidities are a major effect. There's been studies like, the, I think it was the HDS and the ACORD study that showed that hypertension and cholesterolemia had a huge impact in diabetic retinopathy. So in and of itself, I take each and every one of them as the individual I'm going to look to no matter what. But those who are more aware of their disease, those who even are aware of the numbers are actually, in my belief, do better because of the fact that they are actually taking a part of their own managed care. So I think that's really critical. And I think that as optometrists, we really do enlighten the fact that the education is incredibly important. And Dr. Diaz, you know, you see patients, as you mentioned before, it's a spectrum. And you're seeing patients really at the end of the spectrum. You're seeing patients in the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning, where me as a, an optometrist, I'm seeing patients in the first, second, third, fourth, fourth inning. Uh, do you notice any difference in that, that group of patients once they start getting significant retinopathy and they're at risk for blindness? You know, it, it's, it's, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to basically um, just an understanding of their condition, right? Because by the time they get to me, you know, it, it's, it's a little too late sometimes for me to be like, well, this is what happens in diabetes. And it, it's, it's tough because at that point we're playing catch up. And, when, and I tell them that frequently where it's like, you know, I'm here now, we started treatment, but we may still have more vision loss over time. So I think that I would say the people who I see that are earlier on, they understand that they need to be screened. They understand that even having controlled sugars, you can still develop retinopathy over time um, versus people who are in the advanced stages of it. They're kind of, it comes to a surprise to them that this is happening. And, and you know, you kind of wish you can turn back the clock and, you know, go back to their initial time where they were diagnosed and come up with a treatment plan and, and the screening and so forth. Because I think it, it just comes down to a, a lack of knowledge about what they're dealing with and what they're living with. And that brings up a great point, because as we mentioned the, at the beginning, about 50 percent of the population is either diabetic or pre-diabetic. And there's a seven and there's a 700 percent increase in diabetes over the last 40 years. What do you think is the cause of that, Dr. Sheckman? Oh, I know what the cause of that is, obesity. There is no greater correlation than diabetes and obesity. And especially nowadays, COVID was a perfect example. When we were locked in eating, you know, the terrible foods that we're eating, watching Netflix, not moving, like we're ordering Uber every day, that really caused a, a definite increase in and of itself. And I think, and I can definitely attest to it, I know Diaz can as well, we saw more and more worsening of the diabetic patients over time, over the last two, three years. They weren't getting the follow-up care that they needed. And the, the, unfortunately, the behavioral was going the wrong way. But obesity, by no question, has a huge impact on diabetes. And uh, Dr. Diaz, you look like you're in pretty good shape. You used to be an athlete, you played baseball. And I know Dr. Sheckman's a runner. So, all right, we know obesity is a, is a, is a driving factor for diabetes, but what's causing the obesity? I think, I mean, personally, I think it's just uh, the uh, abundance of calorically dense foods. And I think, you know, uh, just how easy it is to sort of have a quick meal uh, for cheaper than ever that 
you know, may satisfy that hunger craving, but unfortunately, you know, is, is, is providing way too many calories that I think we would need as a human being for our current lifestyle. And I would say it's just the ease of access to that, and which is good in one way, but also also bad in the other, especially in the, in the in, when we refer to diabetes. You know, I'm concerned about our kids. You know, they're sitting here looking at these computers all day, these digital devices. And when I was a kid, my mother used to yell at me to come inside. Now the mothers <laughs> are yelling at the kids to go outside. I mean, exactly right. <laughs> so we have we have seventy percent of the adults that are overweight, 40% are obese, 20% of the kids are obese. How much of it is sitting down, looking at the computer and eating processed food and 63% of the food that we eat is processed food? I think a large percentage of it. Yeah. I mean, just think about what, 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 uh, you know, in the new uh, digital age, how much of our source of entertainment and our sort and our ability to connect to one another, no longer did you have to go outside to meet your friends, right? And now you can just basically talk to them through the phone and, and all the apps and so forth. There's no drive or need to go outside and spend time getting to one place or the other. So I think it's, it's basically, it's, it all, it all comes hand in hand. Dr. Shekman, what percentage of people that get diabetes are going to have eye problems from diabetes, either pre-diabetes or diabetes? We're looking probably close to one third. I would say most of the data points out around 28 to 30%, but I would say about one third. And, and what I find most interesting, um, Carrie, and I think you probably see this all the time, is you have a patient who was diagnosed a week ago with diabetes, yet they come to your office and they already have diabetic retinopathy. And they question, say, well, I was just diagnosed yesterday or I was just diagnosed last week. How is that even possible? Without the understanding that this has been a running train going on and you're just diagnosed now, but what we're seeing is effects from a year or two years ago, and you've had these changes going on. But uh, an answer to your question, again, we're looking at about 28% to 30%. So if you could talk, uh, Dr. Shekman, if you could talk about the pathophysiology of diabetes, what's causing it? If you could talk about the parasite level and the basement membrane and what's happening with VEGF, if you could talk about that. So people kind of understand what's happening to those little blood vessels that we could see as eye doctors, we could see the blood vessels. And what's happening here, as Dr. De Silver said so beautifully in our film, it's, it's going to happen here. That's a great point. I like to try to make it simplistic. With patients, I like to try to kind of attach it to something they understand. Um, I talk to them about the vascular changes, the sugar affects these vessels that you have. They're like pipes running inside your eye. And the retina is like a beautiful garden. So these pipes have these parasites right outside, which is the glue that holds them to be impermeable. So it's a seal around these pipes. What happens with the excess sugar is that these seals starts falling off and it becomes almost, these pipes become rusted and they start leaking. So the thickening of the basement membrane and the parasites cause excess leakage from the vasculature. There's weakening that causes these outpouching known as microaneurysms, but basically to them is rusting of these pipes and then they start leaking, causing hemorrhages, exudates, which are lipid and fluid or these clear fluid right into that garden of retina. And uh, Dr. Diaz, talk to me about VEGF, uh, about these growth factors that are released uh, when people get di diabetes because of all the inflammation. Yeah, VEGF is a very, very interesting molecule. It's a pro-angiogenic cytokine, basically, and it has a, it has a number of roles in the body. One for regulating new, uh, the growth of new blood vessels, um, which is typically induced by, by hypoxia. And when we think about diabetes, for example, and all these microvascular damage um, that then basically induces hypoxia and then the body itself then now produces more VEGF. And we get these abnormal blood vessel uh, formation these are not complete blood vessels. They're 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 weak. They are leaky, and they basically um, 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 lead to what we normally describe as diabetic retinopathy. Um, it's also a pro-inflammatory cytokine um, that then can further kind of go down the cascade and cause further inflammation, further further uh, uh, blood vessel leakage and inflammation and edema in, in the retina, for example, and. Um, and yeah, I mean, a lot of the targeted therapies that we have nowadays have basically been been aimed at by blocking VEGF um, and um, has, has worked pretty well. 
What I find interesting is that sometimes, you know, the body produces VEGF, there's always a balance, a homeostatic balance within the body. And sometimes VEGF is important in it. The body is producing it for a good reason. Uh, Dr. Diaz, if you could explain when the body may need VEGF, uh, say a heart attack or a knee, or how, how is, can that be helpful? Well, yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned a heart attack, which is a great example, right? We have an acute lack of blood flow to the to the myocardial tissue and then to sort of uh, prevent scar tissue formation and eventual you know, loss of function of, of, of heart muscle tissue. VEGF is crucial here to develop and regenerate new blood vessels, create collateral formation that can save and limit the development of scar tissue formation, which then over time basically helps you recover from a heart attack. Um, and it's, uh, it is, it is a balance, like you said, and oftentimes it's, it's the body's way to sort of, uh, uh, of identifying that there is a problem and then we need to create it, right? This hypoxia is not allowing me to see, or it's not going to, it's going to damage the retina tissue. And, uh, this is what we need to do to make it better, but it's, it's usually an over exuberance of production of VEGF that then causes a problem. And, um, um, when not controlled. So, you know, it's, it's, you're right. There is definitely a, a, a balance there that needs to be respected. You know, we're going to talk about treatment a little later, but when we talk about these anti-VEGF uh, injections to save people's vision, and they do save people's vision and prolong their vision, whether we're talking about vein occlusions or macular degeneration or diabetes, like we're talking about today, as a retinal surgeon, do you have to consider could this, what the side effects, could this be an, have a negative side effect on the, on the heart where you want to produce these collaterals if someone's had a heart attack and it could prevent the collaterals from being produced? I think the, the, that's a great question. I think the, the biggest, um, I guess, most recent uh, highlight on that has been, for example, in uh, neonatal ICU units where you have, uh, 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 these babies um, with retinopathy or prematurity and whether or not, you know, anti-VEGF injections are going to inhibit, you know, this, this uh, growth of normal blood vessels in, in, the, in the baby's body. And I think that it, it's tough. I mean, research is, is we're looking into it. Um, most of the research is based off risk of MI, for example, after anti-VEGF injection hasn't really borne out to say that there's an increased risk uh, with injection. So personally, for me, if a patient of mine has had recent MIs, you know, I talk to them, I say, hey, you know, there's, there's a theoretical risk here. Um, but if you know, they're monocular and they need their injections, then I would say I would recommend proceeding through it. But, um, you know, we know the systemic absorption is not really that high, um, which is also good. But, you know, it, it doesn't take much for a patient who has multiple comorbidities like coronary artery disease and diabetes and hypertension to maybe tip them over with injections if they're very frequent or too much. So it, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to a discussion between you and the patient and, and, um, and just understanding what our current knowledge is and, uh, and accepting the risk or not. MacU Health, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. How about uh, insulin like growth factor, Dr. Sheckman? So, insulin like growth, when someone is insulin resistant, they, their insulin like growth factor could go up, it could go down, and th that's linked with cancer. There's a lot of people with diabetes get cancer. And that is one of the mechanisms. If you could talk a little bit about that. Well, the ins you're right. The diabetes are a risk for cancers. There's definitely IgA can introduce cancers. Uh, the studies have shown that the IgF uh, serum levels were significantly low in type 2 diabetic patients. And really it has shown that regardless of the absence of other comorbidities or other problems like obesity, um, there is a, is there, there, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Diaz, there is some drugs that they're looking at to be able to call, uh, to be able to target IGF. Am I incorrect about that? No, you're right. It is being explored. Okay. But at this point, they don't have any relationship with the diabetes. They haven't really moved forward to any of it. One of the, the newest one was that angio, the newest one that has been uh, used right now is the angio uh, point two, which actually is the one that's much more exciting. And that's the one that I would like to maybe even bring about when you start the treatment discussion later on. Absolutely. So uh, people that have pre-diabetes, in fact, one of our colleagues did this study to show that even pre-diabetics could get retinopathy. If you could talk about how much retinopathy, what's the percentage of people pre-diabetic that can get retinopathy? And 
what is the number, what is considered pre-diabetic, you know, when you go and get your labs? You want me to answer that? Okay. I'll oh, Dr. Answer Shugman, that. yes. <laughs> Not Let's a problem, I'll answer that. that. Uh, <laughs> so the, the way I see it is I look at that middle number, the pre-diabetic number is easier. And then I know anything above it is diabetic, anything below it is normal. So the pre-diabetic, I look mostly at the A1C, hemoglobin A1C. We're looking at somewhere about 5.7, 5.6 to about uh, 6. 6.4, that's your pre-diabetic number. Then the ones above that, the 6.5 is diabetic and anything below that is technically normal. And of course they can develop changes in the back of the eye. There's no question about it. As a matter of fact, I see them just as commonly. And again, because of comorbidities and other changes, I respect that patient just as well as I respect the patient with diabetes. I've seen a patient who has diabetes for 30 years, we know that the highest risk factor is duration, no question about it. They've had it 30 years, but incredibly controlled. Their comorbidities, they used to follow and have every single A1C number that they have every three months. They were right on control. And then there was a pre-diabetic patient who had severe NPDR. So I, I've seen the worst and, and the best, and it really depends on everything else. What, same thing, would you say, Dr. Diaz, or... Because I know you've you've had pre-diabetic patients that you were considering treating. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 a it's a marker of the last three months of diabetic control. It doesn't mean that it's always been that way. You know, when they Dr. Diaz, when they come up with these numbers, they put a bunch of experts in the room and they and they 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 fight it out for a week or so and they decide, <laughs> okay, this is pre-diabetes, this is diabetes. You know, you you've done some uh, pretty significant research. Well, how does that work when they, these the, the experts are sitting in the room? They come up with the the, the numbers that the rest of the world has to follow. You know, I haven't, I haven't had the privilege of being in that room, but I can imagine that you know it's all about basically just trying to catch the widest net, right? You wanna you wanna create and you wanna land at a number that's gonna give you um, an ability to catch as many people as possible who are at the at risk zone for developing severe complications from diabetes. But you also don't wanna treat everyone that may not develop significant diabetes from it, right? So I think it's all about looking at that bell curve and kind of deciding at which point, you know, do we say this is uh, this needs to be monitored more closely or treatment should be started at this point here. Well, but all understanding that this is not all or nothing. You're going to miss some patients who have pre-diabetes, but they're already having they're already having kidney disease or they're already having diabetic retinopathy, right? So it's it's and I think being as being a uh, and healthcare provider, you kind of have to understand and look at that patient as a whole and be like, yes, that number might look good, but what about everything else? So let's talk about the labs. Let's start with hemoglobin A1C. Uh, Dr. Sheckman, what is it? And uh, you, you're not, you don't love hemoglobin A1C. You have a different way of looking at it. So if you could explain that a little bit. Okay. Well, the hemoglobin A1C, you have the hemoglobin uh, attached to the actual sugar. And that's why the fact that we can get a three month measurement is because a red blood cell only lives for about three months. It is a relatively good number to evaluate and assess primarily because it gives you a three month check, but it only gives you a one snapshot at three months. What happens is we're looking now at cumulative numbers over time, just like Dr. Diaz mentioned. And we're also looking at the perspective of uh, time and range. How long are these patients within their normal fasting blood sugar, within the, the numbers of like 70, say, and 120? What percentage are they within that? And I think that becomes far more critical at times than just watching that snapshot of a hemoglobin A1C, a one-time factor. Dr. Diaz, you have something no, I agree. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, I like when I, when I see patients for the first time and I ask them what the A1C is, I also ask them, is that normal for you? Or is this something that's been higher, lower? I don't want just that one number that tells me right now. I want a more of a picture over the last year. Where have you been? What's your trajectory? Where is it going? Because, I, because as we all know, this is a, this is a disease that takes time to occur and, and, uh, is, is something that, um, just by having one number, at one specific point in time, you, it's hard to derive any data from that. You want trajectory, you want a period of time, and you want to see which way they're heading. And how about continuous glucose monitors? How important do you think that is, and how helpful do you think that is? I mean, I think it's I think I think it's helpful. Um, I you know I, 
if you had a patient who, you know, didn't need to check their blood sugars every, you know, several times a day, but it can just be automatically monitored. I think that's super useful. It, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, and especially when we have patients who have eye disease, for example, you know, checking their own blood sugar is not easy, right? It's technically challenging. Maybe they can't see the, the syringe or the needles. They can't administer their medications. So I think anything that gives you more data over time and it automates a lot of the process, I think is useful. You want to be very careful, of course, because you, know, you also don't want to go too low um, uh, with uh, blood sugar levels, for example. So it, but once again, it's all about data and the more you can get it, the easier you can get it, I think the better for the patient. Dr. Shackman, with, uh, with a CGM, uh, do you ever tell patients, you know, you have this CGM, uh, look at which food is making your blood sugar go high and stay high. This is a, this is a good way of doing a self-test to try to protect yourself. I think I haven't, but I think that's a brilliant idea because I think each one of us are very much individuals. The insulin resistant patient is a perfect example. That patient is not within those numbers exactly like you had mentioned because of the fact that they do have enough insulin and perhaps their carbohydrates. The supply and demand is working out well, but certain foods may change that sugar level to a completely different level. So even though I haven't used it in the past, I think it would be a great idea to start initiating. Dr. Diaz, have you done that? I haven't, but that's a very interesting point. It's a great point. You know, I know anti-aging doctors who they don't have diabetes. They, you know, they don't. They're not insulin resistant. But they were. They were a CGM because they want to see how their blood sugar is changing to try to slow down the aging process. As we know, diabetes is is ages us faster. True. 100%. See, that would be a good seller. You tell most people that they're going to age faster and get uglier because of diabetes, yeah. everyone will be controlling it. You know, and, and looking at the hemoglobin A1C, if it goes from five to six, you triple your risk of getting a heart attack. So, you know, it, blood sugar, keeping your blood sugar monitored and using a CGM could really be a, a, a real helpful tool so people know what foods to eat. A hundred percent agree. Yeah, all, and remember, it's just about uh, knowing the data earlier, right? It's, it's, if you have to wait every three months to kind of know where you're at, you know, it, it, that, that could be tough. What if I could tell you real time what your A1C might be or, you know, and calculate it weekly, for example, I think that'd be useful. Excellent. What other labs are you looking at, uh, uh, Dr. Diaz, when a patient comes in, you're looking at hemoglobin A1C, uh, if you could figure out time and range, what, what else are you looking at that you want to know from the patients? I mean, apart from other comorbidities and, you know, for me, notably high blood pressure is a big one, right? So if they have access to their recent blood pressure readings, I think it's useful, you know, and as far as kidney function is concerned, useful to know uh, because it could be a you know, direct correlate as well to the eyes. But, you know, I, for me, it, it's, it's, it, and also I have limited time with these patients as well sometimes. So the, the bulk of it is going to be A1C and how well you're doing, what are you doing to control it? And uh, is your doctor, you know, working alongside you? Okay, because I think that's that that's going to affect me and, and the patient the most. Dr. Maybe. Diaz, do you still look at fasting blood sugars? Um, you know, I I think the patients tell me, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but personally, I, I don't think I drive as much information from it because once again, it's about period of time. I need to know how frequently I'm going to see you, and just by getting a fasting blood sugar, I think it's hard for me to drive that. So for me, is if your A1C is eight or nine or 10, I'm gonna be you know, watching you more and more closely. So I, I, that's, that's how I've been doing it. Dr. Shackman? Yeah, the one thing I wanted to add is the constant communication, I think it's critical. I've had some patients and some primary care physicians start patient on medications who were pre-diabetic because we found diabetic retinopathy changes. It's end organ damage at the end of the day. So it almost kind of pushed them towards the X start of treatment. So when you were saying what numbers do I like to look at and stuff, I like to more or less keep the primary care physician looking at the numbers, doing right by them. And for me to start really having a constant communication, I think it's critical. And it's not just a PCP. It's a podiatrist, a cardiologist, a neurologist. It's a head-to-toe disease. Uh, Dr. Diaz, you mentioned kid kidney function tests. Which kidney function tests do you look at? And can you help us with interpretation of those? You know, it, it's... Uh, it's I wouldn't say I'm diving into it too deeply on my visits here, but I mean, creatinine and, you know, estimated glomerular filtration rates also be big as well. Um, you know, it's, 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 once again, it takes time for this damage to occur. And I think that 
if you're developing some sort of uh, kidney disease um, from the diabetes, then that tells me that you know we need to be more aggressive with the treatment. Um, but basically, it's it's a measure of of how well the ki kidney is sort of filtering out um, uh, um, you know toxins and so forth, and it's its filtration rate. So if if there's been microvascular damage in the kidney, then that number is going to go up. The time uh, the throughput of the kidneys is going to go down, and I think that's you know that's basically what you're trying to get out of it. Dr. Sheckman, you said before, uh, you've said that it's important to know the stage that you're in, whether you're in mild, moderate, severe. Uh, can you uh, kind of review that for us? Of course. Um, I think, first of all, it's incredibly important for two main reasons. One is a monitoring perspective. And I think I simplify things pretty easily as a one, two, and three. The mild will be seen once a year the moderate will be seen twice a year and the um, severe, well, that's changing. It used to be seen three to four times a year, but now we're initiating treatments and we'll let Dr. Diaz discuss that. In regards to um, the staging aspect, mild is just a couple of changes and we're looking at small microaneurysms and I'll maybe give it a couple of hemorrhages. Anything above that becomes a moderate. So that's pretty easy to make that assumption. And the severe is very specific. The severe is what we call the four, two, one rule four quadrants of hemorrhage, two quadrants of venous beating, and one quadrant of Irma, which are these intraretinal microvascular abnormalities running inside the retina. The key thing about this, and this, is, this was an indirect way of looking at retina, and after working at a retina practice for five years and over the last year working with Dr. Diaz, realizing that those patients really need a fluorescein angiography. It's really the only way you can really truly assess um, capillary dropout. We can do it with OCTA, but we need a wide field to be able to determine. And that's really the best way to determine the a more severe stage, which all of these fall under the NPDR, the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Then you have separate the proliferative diabetic retinopathy stage. You know, when I get students that come or new doctors, they're always confused about IRMA. You know, it's easy for them to see a hemorrhage or, or, or a cotton wool spot or a heart exudate, but Irma, they're totally confused. Can you, either one of you, whoever wants to jump in, can you shed some light on what it looks like and uh, what exactly is it? I'm going to let the retinal specialist take this <laughs> and then I'll add to it as the academic. <laughs> So, you know, it's a good point because it's not always so clear cut, right? And what might look like Irma is this really, a, for example, a small foci of neovascularization. And I think of it, I like to think of it as sort of a spectrum. If I'm, if I'm asking myself, is this Irma, then that's something that right off the bat, I'm saying, okay, well, then this shouldn't be here. And then this needs to be monitored more closely, whether or not it's Irma or an, a foci of neovascularization, um, it's not good at the end of the day, right? Irma tends to be deeper in the retina. Uh, than Frank NV, which goes out from the uh, into the vitreo retinal interface, um, and it's more obvious. It has that sort of elevated appearance to it. For example, um, so retina looks to be deeper. Um, it, it's it's more usually concentrated in the posterior pole um, versus you can have neovascularization on the periphery. Uh, that's more easily seen on fluorescein angiography, for example. So it's 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 tough to. Um, pinpoint unless you get some more more multimodality imaging but at the end of the day it's it's a sign that we're in the, the severe stage and possibly into the proliferative stage at this point so um that's that's sort of how i deal with it and when we talk about progression of diabetic retinopathy what features that you see are more likely signs of progression and what features would you say are a little bit safer uh dr sheckman I think just like uh, Dr. Diaz mentioned, Irma, ven venous beating by nature, automatically tells me this is a sign of progression. As a matter of fact, severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy has about 50% chance within the next year to become proliferative. And uh, over the next, I think it's five years, it's 80%. So any signs that you see from a severe stage likely are going to develop into a proliferative diabetic retinopathy stage. I like to try to kind of tell my patients, you are running towards the edge of a cliff and you're looking right into that bottom. That bottom is your PDR. That's the complications you're going to hit. So we want to kind of slow down that running train that you're going to hit that edge and kind of get you never towards that edge. So it's usually my analogy I like to use for them. Whether it works or not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I want to share my screen now and show some microaneurysms if I could. Sure. Uh, 
if I could do this, let's see if this will work. Uh, there we go. Uh, can can you see that? See them, yes. And so this is if uh, Dr. Diaz, if you could show the microaneurysms, I'll point to them and explain what they are. You know, this is a, an image from an old uh, RHA, which you know was looking at about eight microns, is eight, and does a great job of looking at the vasculature. It would split the retina into ten different sections. And this is 580 uh, nanometer. Uh, and it, we, it really does a really good job of looking at the vasculature. So Excellent. if you could look at those microaneurysms and just uh, as I point to them, explain what they are and what does, it, what does it mean when you start to see somebody that has a lot of these microaneurysms, but doesn't have any hemorrhages? Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, microangiosomes are the earliest clinically visible signs of diabetic retinopathy, right? And it basically is a tiny sort of uh, outpouching of, of a blood vessel. And basically what that tells me is that there's focal microvascular damage to that blood vessel. The pericytes are damaged. And over time, you have these outpouchings. And basically, it just means that there's been, over a period of time, small vessel disease, microvascular ischemic disease, which then over time can lead to, you know, the further stages of diabetic retinopathy, for example. So, um, you know, sometimes they're easily seen, sometimes they're not. And, you know, there's a, there's a big discussion now about this sort of what they're calling a microvascular uh, microaneurysm turnover rate, because some of these microaneurysms can go away and you can develop new ones. And sort of that speed of that disappearance and appearance might be a harbinger of maybe more rapid progression of diabetic retinopathy which, you know, I think there's a lot of research that still needs to, be, needs to be done on that, but it's interesting. It's a marker of microvasculature damage. And, um, you know, the second that you see it, you have to be aware of it. Hi, uh, Dr. Shackman, any comments about that? I can't top that one. That was great. <laughs> no. uh, but one thing I do want to add is uh, you read free, I think helps me tremendously to see microaneurysms. Oftentimes, you know, diabetic patients, you have a small little pupil, you can't get in through the back, you're looking for a cataract, it's really hard to be able to see them. And I think Red Free has helped me tremendously to be able to pick these up. Um, also OCTA, I think it's a great way to look at some of these uh, earlier changes that certainly can develop into bigger problems. Great paper, you got Jerry Sherman in there too. So this was a, a paper we did in 2016 that was uh, uh, published in, in Diabetes and it showed that those, we took people who had microaneurysms but no retinopathy and we showed that it correlated very well with insulin resistance doing fasting insulin and uh, two, ins two hour insulin levels. So I just wanted to show that, to show that to you. And it goes along exactly with what Dr. Diaz said. So it's a great example. So let's talk about technology. We were talking, started to talk a little bit about technology. What technology, Dr. Shackman, do you use uh, in your office to help you to find people who have diabetic retinopathy uh, to be able to find it a little bit sooner to be able to help our patients? Um, well, certainly I'm very lucky to have all the different diagnostic modalities. Um, there's probably only one that I don't have. I'm a little bit familiar with, but not as familiar. I think Dr. Diaz probably had it at Bascom. Uh, but certainly I think photos are important, um, especially with the uh, red free. I think that's very helpful. I do have wide field imaging. So optos, a lot of the peripheral changes do occur in patients, which also has an increased progression. And oftentimes we miss that mid periphery peripheral areas. So wide field imaging, I think it's really important. I used to have an OCTA in my other office and when I was at Nova as well. So I used to use OCTA quite a bit. OCT, definitely standard of care, particularly for evaluating progression, access of any diabetes, diabetic macular edema changes. And of course, for treatment at hand. Uh, we have fluorescein in the office. I think that's still probably not used as much as we used to use. And I'll let Dr. Diaz talk more about that. But certainly, I think it's really important. And the one tool that I'm missing, although I think there is definitely a place for this, is BEP. Now, let me ask you about OCTA. Uh, uh, who, whoever wants to jump in, you know, with OCTA, we could see capillary dropout. 
Now, we, at, sometimes you'll wind up doing an OCTA on somebody for a different reason. And then you see, because you're not doing a routine, but you see capillary dropout, or maybe they're diabetic and you want to see if, they're cap, if they have capillary dropout. So if they only have capillary dropout and nothing else, what should we be thinking, Dr. Diaz? Uh, you know, to me, if there's, for example, there's, if they are diabetic and there's just a capillary dropout, I mean, I just have to be monitored, I'm monitoring them a little more closely, right? Because that capillary dropout is going to be what induces hypoxia, which then leads to VEGF levels being increased and then over time, increased risk of, of neovascularization. So, you know, it, it, OCTA is a great technology. There are, you know, potent, you know, potential limitations to it, right? Projection artifacts and so forth. You have to know how to use it in order to be able to interpret that data correctly, right? So um, by being aware of that, I think you can probably maximize it. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think it's fantastic if you have it and you can use it. Um, and then more and more research has been shown that it is actually, you know, possibly gonna replace fluorescein in the future. Um, but like I said, it, it's, it's, you have to be careful to uh, make sure you're analyzing the correct layers that what, what might be capillary dropout is not projection artifact or, 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 any, or any sort of other artifact from the imaging modality. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit oiebroadcasting.com and sign up today. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Each generation was supposed to be healthier than the last one. Lifespan was supposed to be increasing. We were supposed to be in this paradise by now. Instead of getting healthier and healthier, it seems to have gone the opposite way. Millennials were projected to be the first generation in history to not outlive the generation before them. We are certainly headed for disaster. I think a lot of people are beginning to question the whole story. We live in a time where the paradigms are shifting. And the optometrist, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets. The public doesn't realize about going to the eye doctor. So many different diseases actually manifest in the eye. The back of the eye is the only place in the body that you could actually see the blood vessels. Completely non-invasively, you could screen thousands of people, not just for their eye health, but for their whole body health. Because this disease is here, it's also going to be here. And I can look into the back of my eyeball, and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at my eyeball while I'm doing it. The eye is the canary of the mind. The eye is the kingdom. Well, Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.